name is Ryan, and I'm a paranormal investigator. When I was a kid, my experiences with the supernatural terrified me, and I've been searching for answers ever since. So when I got to Penn State, I realized I wasn't alone in my quest. So I founded the Paranormal Research Society, dedicated to helping those who were haunted like I was. We are students. We are seekers. Sometimes we're warriors. And each time we help someone, I feel like I'm one step closer to finding the truth. This is Paranormal State. Paranormal State. All right, I've had a lot of requests for this one. And to me, this one just seems like uh, ghost hunters for emo kids. You know, it's like a group of college kids all got together and founded this paranormal research society. And they go out with uh, kind of, they're, they're kind of basing their pretense like they're out to just help people, you know, that are, you know, being haunted or possessed or whatever. Um, and the show is, you know, edited a little better than most others. I can't say better as in more entertaining, but uh, they try to hide, cover their tracks a lot better. Uh, there was an episode called The Messenger, I believe, where a Kelly Robinson had these people come. Let me make sure that's the right name here. Kelly Ryan, I'm sorry, my mistake. Uh, I had these people come to their house to, you know, do this story, and the show completely went differently than what was actually going on. This lady is a bit of a quack herself. Uh, some kind of she's some kind of medium supposedly, and talks to uh, this friendly spirit who was killed. You know, local guy who was killed in a car wreck. Uh, his friend was driving apparently, and so she wanted the paranormal state guys to come out and do an investigation and let this other guy know that's still alive. You know that this ghost of his, his friend, you know, wasn't blaming him, you know, you know, that it was okay. But instead they come out and all hilarity breaks loose. They get, you know, the headless horseman down there. I mean, it's, it's terrible. And they bring in uh, a psychic named Chip Coffey, who is a recent Pegasus Award winner from James Randi and was involved with the Psychic Kids TV show, which is probably how this guy got involved with them, being a... Uh, youngster plagued by the paranormal so who knows but I mean they say that you know they had to video t you know give a video tour of their house and mail it out to the psychic so he can kind of understand what's going on then when he shows up you know it's supposed to be like his first appearance and he all of a sudden knows all this stuff about the case which was all sent to him you know in a videotape you know, he knew this stuff prior it's pretty sad but like I said, they do a, a ton of editing in this show, and it's hard to even follow anything. But I did find some discrepancies, and let's get to it. Uh, but first, um, the show's kind of a ripoff, in my opinion, um, not only from Ghost Hunters. I mean, granted, he kind of it's almost like he took this show called, that used to be out on, I believe it was the Learning Channel, called Dead Tenants. He kind of stole the intro idea, you know, with, you know, a recorded intro. I'll play them both here. Hello. My name is Ryan, and I'm a paranormal investigator. Hello. You've reached PRS, the Preternatural Research Society. Please leave a message after the beep. Granted, one of them's using an answering machine, the other one's using a tape recorder, and even their initials are the same, Preternatural Research Society and Paranormal Research Society. Coincidence? Who knows? So before we get to the debunking part, let's go over some strange things I found while watching a few of these episodes. To knock this down? We gotta knock this down to come to some conclusion. Let's knock it down. Should I start going too or what? And I think that we just gotta see when, if ever, they're willing to share more about that. What kind of toy was that? Um, was it like a truck or? No, um, it was actually a vacuum. All right, so what did we learn there? No matter where they go in the country, the lightning is exactly the same. Here, look at these three shots. I'm going to take three stills from all three episodes and see if it's the same lightning or not. Okay, I can forgive them for using the same lightning shot in three different episodes. I mean, it's hard to get lightning shots. Screw it. You know, they can recycle that. No big deal. 
Uh, one I really can't forgive them for, though, is when they did the Mothman episode in West Virginia, they showed a landmark there, which is the Low Hotel. And then, again, they went and filmed an episode in Texas and showed the hotel they were staying at, and it was the Low Hotel. And then they did an episode in Pennsylvania, and they showed the hotel they were staying at, and it was the Low Hotel. Uh, they keep showing the same hotel in several episodes, like they're staying there when it's actually in West Virginia, but they show it in an episode in Texas and in Pennsylvania. So, moving on, they did an episode called The Name. And they're sitting around doing their little seance, and a creaky door opens up in the basement. Let's see that. Who's that? Did someone just open up a door or a move in the basement over? No. Terrifying. Except the problem is, in a little bit later episode at another person's house, we get to see this. I've just finished up an interview with Helen. Though grief-stricken, it's obvious that she believes the Dark Man has something to do with Chris's death. So now we're going to break off in the teams to learn about the paranormal activity in the house. In the basement, recently, we've been having some problems over in that little room over there. When we were looking in here, we came out, and uh, the woman that was with me, it grabbed her by the arm and left a mark on her arm. It was like a... Absolutely astonishing. We've got a demon-possessed door that's somehow um, phasing in between two different houses in two different episodes. Is uh, It must be possessed. In the, the name episode, we see this door that is magically swung open. It has a wooden frame with slats nailed to it. And we have a funky-looking top one. If we count down three, you can see a stain right in the middle of the door. Then when we switch over to the Dark Man episode, we see a door of similar construction with a wooden frame and slats nailed to it. And if we count down, we see we get, don't get a good uh, we get a better look at the top frame here, or the top slat in this one. But if we count down, we see the same stain in the middle of the door, on the third panel down. Coincidence? I think it's paranormal. So basically, all we have here is a staged shot from one episode that didn't get used, got left on the editing room floor, and so they recycled it and used it as a staged prop in another episode. Faking. I just what saw shadow him. stuff. Did Hold you on. see it? Yeah, I just saw something go into the bathroom. I'm gonna go check. Hold on, Chip. There's definitely something down this hall. Come on, show yourself. He's getting mad. He doesn't like this. He's pissed. What is that? There's something very, very cold, colder by 10 degrees on the bed. Turn the light on. Wow. Oh my God! Not not the cut to commercial edit. All right, so we got uh, old Ryan boy and Psychic Coffee. Supposedly they're chasing this ghost down this hallway, and they're walking around with their thermal camera, and they're gonna, you know, see if they can track it down. It don't. It's not in the bathroom like they originally thought. So they open the bedroom door, and lo and behold, sitting on the bed is there's something. Very, very cold, colder by 10 degrees on the bed. Turn the light on. Oh. Whoa. I saw the human outline. I did too. Bill, is this you trying to communicate with us? This fucking idiot expects us to believe he's right there with a video camera, you know, watching this thing, and he doesn't record anything. He just says they saw a human outline on the, you know, on the bed, and the other guy confirms, yeah, I saw it too. Problem is, they showed us what they saw. We saw a picture of the thermal imager. This is what we saw. We saw this can of beer or soda or whatever that is. That's cold sitting in the middle of the damn room. This is totally set up, staged, and just completely fake. I'm starting to lose my patience with this clown. If you think us women folk are talking out of turn, express yourself. All right, something else that's been bugging me is this chick here on the left. 
throughout all these episodes, I kept thinking I've seen her somewhere before, and so I stopped to do some uh, looking around, and sure enough, this is Michelle Bellinger, and I saw her in the A&E documentary, uh, The True Story of Vampires, or something like that. Let's check her out. No matter how suave or debonair a vampire looks in the movies, you have no heartbeat. Everyone knows what he's after. Perhaps he just needs to be rekindled. That vital life energy within us all, blood. It's an entertaining image, but it falls flat with most modern vampires, for whom blood is no longer the death and life thing it's made out to be in the movies. Instead, the life force most of them crave is something called psi, or psychic energy. I am more than willing and think that it is not anything mystical or esoterical or occult, that it is actually something that is entirely within the reign of modern science to understand. Uh, we may not have developed all of the machinery and tools necessary to, to uh, measure it. Michelle Belanger is the author of the Psychic Vampire Codex, a manual that teaches psi vampires how to feed on this vital human energy they claim to need. While most of us can't see, hear, taste, or touch it, according to Michelle, we all project it. If you go someplace and you are wound up in your bad mood, whether you realize it or not, you are projecting that everywhere and as a vampire you realize that everybody everywhere is constantly connected constantly exchanging energy michelle says at one point she tried to get by without feeding on this energy and it made her so sick she needed to be hospitalized as a psychic vampire there is what amounts to like a diabetes um, of of the spirit of the the energy body there is something that doesn't work quite right and it impacts not just your, your emotional or energetic health eventually it starts to impact your physical health now to stay healthy she feeds about every two weeks a week passes a week and a half passes i start getting a, a little tired uh, a little bit more distractible forgetful and just you know less focused less sharp and that's kind of my sign that i need to do it Michelle allowed us to film an exchange between herself and Zamian, her regular human donor. It's a deeply private moment, not exactly the stuff of a horror flick. The relationship between the vampire and donor is not one of dominance and submission. It's not one of predator and prey. It is one of two people celebrating something that they share on a very deep level. In fact, the ritual looks a bit like a sensual massage. Michelle says she's drawing in Zamian's energy with her hands and mouth. A lot of the action is purely internal. Whether I am actually breathing in from the person or putting my hands there, I'm using the breath to focus what I'm taking from them. I'm literally breathing the person in. This exchange only lasts five minutes, though others can go much longer. Thank you. Afterward, Michelle says she feels refreshed, and Samian also claims to feel different. Chills, a little disoriented, elated. But not everybody buys the idea of energy transfers. Some traditionalists say Dracula would roll over in his grave at the thought of it. It's easy to be skeptical about what psychic vampires say they can do. But it would also be unfair to not show something strange captured by our own video camera. After following Michelle most of the night at Dracula's Ball, we began an interview early the next morning with a set of newly charged batteries. So, you find this with a lot of people in the subculture. I interfere with cell phone reception. I can't keep batteries and cell phones or digital cameras to... But, to save the life of me charged. Oddly enough, our camera began to pick up strange interference. Then, just a few minutes later, the fresh batteries suddenly went dead, abruptly ending the interview. So they got Psycho Vampire Lady on their ghost hunting crew, which only raises the question to me, how does their equipment stay working? 
if she's draining batteries and shit off, you know, just by being near, I mean, isn't she throwing their instrumentation just all out of whack and shit, picking up all kinds of vampire psychic readings or she's sucking their brain thoughts out and who knows what else? How do they keep batteries charged? I don't get it. Let's watch this scene. If you think us women folk are talking out of turn, express yourself. Come on, wife beater. Ooh, what was that? What was that? Holy, what is it? The light broke. Why are you so defensive about us talking about you and your wife? You want to do something to scare a family? Scare us. We've been around this. Bring it. I'm right here. You pick on me every night. Pick on a grown man. You hear that? Yeah. What? Stop, stop. Are you serious? That just flew. Holy What was it? It flew. Whoa! What is it? What is it? It's a light. light. Dude, it just like came down on me. You saw me. She said, do you feel that? And there was creaking sounds all above here. You and know. this just fell. Ooh, they're up in the attic of this place and a ghost broke two lights. But since we got those lights on camera and they showed it on video, let's take a closer look at those lights. Dad. Holy What is it? The light broke. What is it? It's a light. light. Dude, it just like came down. So let's take a still shot from each of those scenes and look at this glass. So here we see the glass in scene number one, and here is the glass in scene number two. Look familiar? It's the same glass. They filmed this scene, it broke one piece of glass, and then they ran back over and pretended that it broke again and filmed it again, not, you know, not realizing that we could actually stop and look at this glass and realize that it was the same glass in both scenes. And actually they even had a bigger slip up in this scene. Remember, they're up in the attic of this place. Now let's look at the wall behind the glass and see what it looks like. So what do we got here? Concrete floor and cinder blocks back there. Well, wasn't they just up in an attic? Hell no, they staged this down in the basement and edited the scene in later. Let's take a look at the attic again. If you think us women folk are talking out of turn, express yourself. Come on, wife beater. Ooh, what was that? What was that? Holy, what is it? The light broke. Why are you so defensive about us talking about you and your wife? You want to do something to scare a family? Scare us. We've been around this. Bring it. I'm right here. You pick on me every night. Pick on a grown man. You hear that? Yeah. What? Stop, stop. Are you serious? That just flew. Holy What was it? It flew. Whoa! What is it? What is it? It's a, a light. light. Dude, it just like came down on me. You saw me. She said, do you feel that? And there was creaking sounds all above here. You and know. this just fell. So we look around the attic and the upstairs of this house. We don't see no cinder blocks anywhere. But we did get to see cinder blocks earlier when they were down in the basement. All right, one more thing, and then I'm done with these clowns. Michelle, did you put your hand on the wall? Like, right to your right shoulder? No, right where my hands are here. You sure? Because there's a handprint right there. There is. No, right. it was... You didn't put your hands... She couldn't have, dude. No, I did not touch the wall up there. Look, if she just touched it here, right next to it, I'll just touch it, and watch how bright this is, okay? Yep. All right. Yeah, you're right. See what I'm saying? Doesn't match up. That was from up. a while ago. Ryan, that is a bad piece of evidence, dude. On, you will see my handprint completely dissipates as this one still remains. Still remains longer. Yep. Did we even look at the temperature difference for the handprints? We can look at it right now. I don't think you were ever trained yeah. on it long enough to really. Yeah, I mess how I really feel. Too. Show. Well, oh, hold on. Seventy-nine point seven around there. Right. Yeah, so when I drop mine on it, it goes down yeah, it's like dissipating. almost almost a degree. Like one degree, it goes down. Not it's even slowly a slowly dissipating. It's crazy. So there is no way at that point that mine should dissipate before this one. Yeah, absolutely. There's no way that should happen. So I don't get it at all. 
Well, he don't get it because he apparently thinks everybody watching the show is as big of an idiot as he is. And nobody understands things like heat transfer. Um, if I place my hand on a wall for 10 minutes and let that heat transfer go, I'm going to heat up the wall significantly more than if I put another hand up there for five seconds and pull it down. The one up there for five seconds is going to dissipate faster than the one where I allowed more heat to transfer. Of course that's what we're looking at here because we see the girl's back against the wall. And then when she moves out of the way so they can do it, her back print stays on the wall the same amount of time as the, as the hand print does. She transferred enough heat, just like the other the, the hand print did. This is absolutely moronic. And they're like, this is a badass piece of evidence, dude. And these people don't even know how to work a freaking uh, face mask, let alone thermal imaging equipment. But he goes on to say something in an early episode that pretty much sums up the way I feel about all of these morons. So what were some of those early investigations like? Penn State has a lot of unique paranormal history. There were a few unsolved deaths here. My first two cases were those of Betsy Artsma, a grad student killed in the stacks, and then there's Cindy Song, a girl who went missing on Halloween night in 2001. That case caught national attention and landed me and the newly formed PRS in the spotlight. Which just goes to show what they really had to offer since both those cases remain unsolved to this day. So throwing that on his resume like it's some big deal is nothing. He didn't do anything to help out at all. He just associated with the case because he, you know, the word paranormal or something. The guy didn't do anything. And so th these shows are just so lame, and I can't believe people buy into them, but they do. Uh, people will defend these guys. You know, their fanboys are absolutely insane, and they will defend these guys. Oh, it's real. You know, I've, I've been in conversations with them. It's just retarded the level of fanboyism from people who want to believe this crap but can't face reality. So I have nothing else to say about these guys just other than, you know, it sucks that they're making money ripping people off, you know, through their gullibility. And, you know, <clears throat> I can watch this stuff and tear it a new one, no problem, and I'm flat broke. So that just goes to show you where the money's at. People could really care less about the truth, and the people who enjoy these videos are in the minority. So or the videos I'm making, put it that way. This is absolutely ridiculous. And this, it's sad to see our, you know, collective nation, you know, be more in tune with idiocy than reality. So take care, everybody. Is there